have just seen all 13 species of hummingbirds which make their homes in the United States. We'll meet them all later in this program. And we'll learn what makes our hummingbirds the most amazing and exciting of birds. And we'll learn how to have a very close and special relationship with them. Hi, I'm Michael Godfrey, exploring with you the hummingbirds around us. Right now, I've got a very important question for you. What is a hummingbird? Above all else, a hummingbird is a very small bird. The calliope hummingbird of the western states is the smallest bird in North America. We think of a chickadee as a small bird, but it would take five ruby-throated hummingbirds to equal the weight of a chickadee. Hummingbirds are the only birds in North America which make us wonder if it is indeed a bird we've seen. Zipping around a bed of flowers, a tiny hummingbird can seem quite insect-like, and we have to look twice to be sure we're not looking at a large bee or a sphinx moth hovering on clear wings and probing for nectar, just as a hummingbird does. Hummingbirds are the only birds which hover at flowers. On wings cycling as fast as 80 times per second, these birds hover far more proficiently than other birds. Watch these black-chinned hummingbirds move in perfect harmony with the feeder. These ruby throats are so confident they can vanish in a trice that they casually approach the most questionable of creatures. This mastery of timing lets the hummingbirds indulge an incessant curiosity. Any change in their territory may bring an opportunity, and the birds are quick to take advantage of it. So developed is their flight proficiency that hummingbirds have no need to walk. Their minute feet serve only to grasp a perch. So simple a move as turning around, this male Anna's makes on the wing. Most colors in nature are made by pigments, chemicals which absorb light in all wavelengths except the one to be reflected. The red, for example, on this cardinal. The cardinal shows the same colors in just about any light. But on the grackle, the metallic colors change as the bird moves. This is iridescence, a mechanical rather than chemical treatment of light to create color. The grackle has no color. He's black as coal. But his feathers are refracting light like tiny prisms to produce the array of iridescent hues. A flash of iridescence at the throat is an adornment unique to hummingbirds. But hummingbirds take iridescence a step further than other birds. Through a phenomenon called interference, the feathers in the gorget, the bib of color at the throat of male hummingbirds, produce intense colors. Light waves of all colors strike the gorget. A thin film on the feathers refracts and reflects the light so that colors of undesired wavelengths cancel or interfere with their counterparts reflected from the surface. For colors of the desired wavelength only, the wave action inside the film matches and amplifies the reflected waves, creating a pure color. The flat shape of the veins of the gorget feathers makes these interference colors directional. Sun, bird, and observer must be aligned to produce the gorget flash. Otherwise, the bib appears dark. Imagine the advantage a bird has when he can control who sees his colors, how he might intimidate a rival, or dazzle a mate by maneuvering down sun to flash a beam of color. Typically, females are plain compared with the males, 
and in no species do females show the fully developed gorget. The female Anna's shows more color at the throat than the female of any other U.S. hummingbird. The females get their point across by fanning their white-tipped tails. This gesture serves no aerodynamic purpose. It is simply a body language statement of dominance, usually accompanied by vocal threats. In most species, males have plain tails, but the male of a U.S. species with a subdued gorget, the blue-throated hummingbird, does have white spots to enlarge the appearance of his tail. In this encounter, the dominant male actually puts himself in a disadvantaged position, the better to show his tail feathers. The belted kingfisher is among those birds which may hover briefly, but not by the same means a hummingbird hovers. With their immense flight muscles, up to one-third the bird's weight, hummingbirds develop almost as much power on the upstroke as on the downstroke. The upstroke of a hummingbird's wing is a power stroke just like the downstroke. The wing is articulated only at the shoulder, like the wing of an insect. It acts on the air as an oscillating propeller with more of a continuous force than the paddle stroke effect of other birds' wings. Notice how the surfaces of the wings reverse, the top side of the wing becoming the underside on the upstroke. The ability to hover permits hummingbirds to use the nectar from flowers as their main source of energy. On large flowers, such as the trumpet creeper, the bird may rest briefly at the lip of the blossom. But though they are tiny birds, few flowers could support them if they had to perch to feed. The insects would then have the nectar all to themselves. Nectar is, in a word, sugar. A strong solution of sugar which the flowers provide to attract pollinators. Nectar is the bait the plants use to manipulate the so-called higher life forms into serving as transfer agent for their pollen. Sucrose, common table sugar, is the main ingredient in the nectar of flowers which attract hummingbirds. Sucrose is the sugar hummingbirds like best, and it is readily digested. But a hummingbird's food is used very quickly, and it must eat frequently. Hovering flight consumes a crop full of nectar about every 15 minutes. Each visit to a flower yields a minute sip, and a hummingbird's life depends on maintaining a balance between the nectar it can find and the energy required to find it. If a hummingbird cannot feed as needed, it may have to enter a torpor in which metabolism and activity are reduced to save energy. This fledgling ruby throat, in a serious energy deficit, just made it to the feeder, where it hopes to recover. We'll return to him shortly to see how he fared in the fast-moving world of the sugar eater. Nectar provides energy for the hummingbirds, but like us, they must also have protein and other nutrients which they get from very small insects. The catch is nearly impossible to watch, naked eye, but the amazing agility is ours to see in slow motion. This Anna's grabs a passing gnat in California. a black chin in Arizona. In North Carolina, a spiderling tries to bail out of a cardinal flower visited by this ruby throat. Because protein is the food of growth, it is mainly insects which the female feeds to her nestlings. The mother blue-throated hummingbird plunges her bill into the young to pump in the rich mixture of insects for growth and nectar for the energy used in flight testing. 
The solid waste fired out of the nest by the young is mostly undigested insect parts. Hummingbirds live only in the Western Hemisphere. There are about 320 species in all. Ecuador has about 160 species, and diversity diminishes with distance from the equator. Mexico hosts about 40 varieties, and 12 breed in the USA. East of the Mississippi River, we have but a single species, the ruby-throated. We have relatively few species north of the Rio Grande, but except in the northern Great Plains, hummingbirds are abundant throughout the USA. We can easily identify the adult males, such as this magnificent hummingbird. They're quite distinctive. But most of the individuals we see are either females or immatures. By late summer, perhaps one hummingbird in 10 or 20 will be an adult male. The real challenge lies in the nuances of female and sub-adult plumages. In the east, the ruby throat is ubiquitous. It is virtually certain to be present wherever a hummingbird garden is planted and feeders are hung. West of the Great Plains, the ruby throat's close relative, the black-chinned hummingbird, is equally common and responsive. Occasionally, the sun catches the little band of amethyst under the black chin. In winter, both species are seen along the Gulf Coast and the field guides say the females are indistinguishable. But watch for the black chin's constant tail flipping, and upper parts paler than the ruby throats, and you'll fool the experts. The broad-tailed is the common hummingbird of alpine meadows in the Rockies. Markings are nearly identical to the ruby throats, but there's no confusion because the ranges are hundreds of miles apart. Also, the male broad-tailed hummingbird is easily identified by the distinctive whistle of his wings. On females, the flanks and base of the tail show rust. Anna's is the most common hummingbird of the Pacific states. It is said to be on the move eastward, having in a few decades expanded its range from Southern California across all of Arizona and into New Mexico. The rosy iridescence pulses not only on the gorget, but on top of the head as well. Females wear a diamond at the throat, a feature enlarged on young males. Costas is a desert hummingbird, common in dry washes and chaparral in Southern California and Arizona where you may find Acostas bathing at a desert oasis. The male's long beard of a gorget reaches nearly to the wing. The female is chunky and plain white below.
you're looking at the smallest bird on the North American continent, the calliope hummingbird. This female calliope is perched on a wire the size of the lead in a wooden pencil. She and her mate are so minute, they are often dismissed as insects. The unbelievably small size, streaking at the throat, and apricot flanks identify females and immatures. The wingtips overlap the tail of the perched calliope. Miniatures in an elfin realm, calliopes compete skillfully at the feast of life and are common visitors to feeders and to high meadows in the west. The rufus is our longest ranging migrant and our most northerly hummingbird. It's the only hummingbird to nest in Alaska and some individuals migrate 2,000 miles to winter in Mexico. Males are rust colored with an orange red gorget. They're notably belligerent at food sources. Females are stippled at the throat, rusty on the flank and green across the cap and shoulders. Female rufus and the young of the year cannot be distinguished from comparable plumages of Allen's hummingbird, which is principally a California bird. Even experts on seeing an immature or female Allen's or rufus refer to them simply as Salasphorus, the name of the genus of both. The test for adulthood in males of both Allens and Rufus hummingbirds is the fully developed gorget. Together with his orange-red gorget, the adult male Rufus wears a uniform of warm rust. The back is clear of any other coloration. The adult Allens male shows the fully developed gorget and retains green across the shoulders and on the cap. Note the absence of green on the adult male rufus. These hummingbirds are common and widespread. Within their ranges, you're very likely to attract them. But there are some additional and really spectacular birds which barely cross our southern borders into a magical realm of mountains and wet canyons places such as Cave Creek Canyon. Naturalist and nature tour guide Victor Emanuel explains why southeastern Arizona is our hummingbird capital. To talk for a few minutes about why there is such a great diversity of birds in southeastern Arizona that brings so many bird watchers to this part of the country. We see a lot of species that don't occur in other parts of the United States, and especially where there are so many kinds of hummingbirds. As you know, in most parts of the United States, at least eastern Mississippi, is only one species of hummingbird, the ruby throated hummingbird, that regularly occurring. A few others occasionally wander in to migration. It's only one that breeds east of the Mississippi. While in Arizona, there are upwards of 14 or 15 species of hummingbirds, including some accidental ones. And the main reason is that there are four biotic provinces that come together here. The Rocky Mountain Biotic Province, the Chihuahuan Biotic Province, the Mojavean Biotic Province, and the Sierra Madrian Bi Biotic Province. Within each of these habitats, the Mojavean, the Chihuahuan, the Sierra Madrian, and the Rocky Mountain, we have different elevational zones. We saw when we drove up into Chiricahua. As you rise in elevation, you have different plant types. So all of this gives a wide diversity of habitats. A wide diversity of habitats gives a wide diversity of hummingbirds. So you have, for example, from the Rocky Mountain Biotic Province, you've got the broad-tailed hummingbird. From the Sierra Madrian Biotic Province, coming up from Mexico, you've got the magnificent hummingbird, the blue-throated hummingbird, the violet-crowned hummingbird, uh, occasionally the barrel-eyed hummingbird and the white-eared hummingbird and the broad-billed hummingbird, several species that enter from Mexico into Arizona. As Victor speaks, a lucifer hummingbird 
from the Chihuahuan Biotic Province makes a visit. The rare Lucifer and the very common black-chinned hummingbird are Chihuahuan birds. And then from California, the Mojavean Biotic Province, you have the Anna's hummingbird coming in from the California desert and the Costa hummingbird that we saw yesterday. So you have a lot of overlap of different biotic provinces here all meeting in southeastern Arizona. In this wonderland of desert mountains and wet canyons, Victor and his expedition search out the rarest of our hummingbirds. The blue-throated hummingbird summers reliably in the canyons of southeastern Arizona. The blue-throated is our largest hummingbird, but it is not a brilliantly colored bird. To compensate for his want of jewelry, the male blue throat shows the white-tipped tail feathers worn only by females of other U.S. hummingbirds. The blue-throated female, of course, also wears white in her tail. Bouncing whistled notes off the walls of his canyon, the blue throat is the vocalist of a tribe in which raspy twitters pass for song. Formerly Rivoli's hummingbird, the magnificent is our darkest, males appearing blackish in most views, except for the violet-green gorget. You need just the right light to see the purple iridescence on the crown, but a raised crest is part of the male's bluster. The magnificent hummingbird is almost as large as the blue-throated, or perhaps twice as hefty as a black chin or a ruby throat. The female magnificent resembles the blue-throated female, but shows very little white in the tail. Toward late summer, young male magnificents begin to show the dazzling colors which have been called spectacular. The broad-billed hummingbird is also common in the wooded canyons of southeastern Arizona. The bill is wide, as the name suggests, to spread the blossoms of its favored food plants. The Santa Rita Lodge at Madera Canyon, just south of Tucson, is a reliable site for breeding broadbills. This male is so jealous of his penstemon patch that even a female nesting nearby is unwelcome. Females wear a dark facial stripe. Young males show a progression of plumages in adolescence, maturing to dark cavaliers with crimson sword. This very rare Baraline hummingbird, a wandering rogue from Mexico, was filmed at the Santa Rita Lodge in Madera Canyon in August of 1987. It may have been the only Baraline to visit the United States that year. The Baraline occasionally nests in the U.S., and summer appearances in the Santa Rita Range are among the exciting reasons for a hummingbird trip to southeastern Arizona. The summer sounds of southern Texas include the shrieking of a local locust and the wing drum of the buff-bellied hummingbird. The buff-bellied is a close relative of the barreline hummingbird, is equally aggressive, and is much more numerous in the U.S. As with the barreline, the sexes of the buff-bellied are similar. Formerly known in Texas only from the lower Rio Grande Valley, 
the buff-bellied now dominates feeders as far north as Corpus Christi. Lucifer hummingbirds, minute musketeers with curved rapier, nest and wander casually into the borderlands of Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. The Lucifer is a reliable visitor to Cave Creek Canyon, where its every move draws admiration. Our camera found this violet-crowned female nesting high in a sycamore along Sonoita Creek south of Patagonia, Arizona. Both sexes of the violet-crowned are pure white below. The male has no gorget. Author and birding tour guide Rick Taylor offers some tips on where to find the rarest of our hummingbirds. When planning a trip to the southeastern Arizona for hummingbirds, I suggest the month of August because not only are the breeding birds present, but also we have post-breeding season dispersal to feeders of many rare species of Mexican hummingbirds, such as the violet crown hummingbird. There are perhaps a dozen violet ground hummingbirds breeding in Guadalupe Canyon in any given year. After the uh, rainy season and after the breeding season, we find violet crown hummingbirds at a variety of location at hummingbird feeders in Madera Canyon, at Ramsey Canyon, at Portal, at the roadside rest area near the town of Patagonia is another good location for violet ground hummingbird. Uh, some of the other rarities one can find down here are lucifer hummingbirds at Portal, white-eared hummingbirds at Portal, and perhaps up in the South Fork of Cave Creek Canyon, and the uh, bear-line hummingbird at feeding stations at Madera Canyon, at Ramsey Canyon, and perhaps even breeding. We had a breeding as late as September of the bear-line hummingbird at Chiricahua National Monument. I would suggest that anyone coming to southeastern Arizona for hummingbirds go directly to Ramsey Canyon. The folks up there have the latest information on any rare hummingbirds found in southern Arizona. Plus, up to 16 species of hummingbirds have been recorded in the Huachuca Mountains. The cool glades of Ramsey Canyon, just south of Sierra Vista, Arizona, are critical to some of our rarest hummingbirds. In Ramsey Canyon, the Arizona Nature Conservancy operates a preserve well known for hummingbirds. It's called Mile High. Feeders bring the birds to Mile High's cabin porches and to a day trip viewing area. Mile High is managed by Debbie and Tom Colazzo. Birders are welcome in Ramsey Canyon every day of the year. Our hours are eight to five, and if you have to visit on Saturday, Sunday, or a holiday, we ask that you give us a call ahead so that we can reserve a parking spot for you. The majority of hummingbird species reside in one place, but those which have seized upon opportunities in temperate North America must migrate to avoid our chilly and flowerless winters. Countless hummingbirds migrating through the desert valleys of southeastern Arizona depend upon the juicy flowers of the agave, or century plant. Hummingbirds which elect a higher migration route time their travels to the blooming of such flowers as bluebells and delphiniums in the alpine meadows. The rufous is our most northerly nester, and in spring it may trek from Mexico's warmth to breeding sites in southern Alaska.
Ruby throats are thought to span the 600 miles of open water separating the Gulf Coast from the Yucatan Peninsula, a nonstop marathon of 20 hours or more. The fuel for this trip is fat, equaling one half the bird's normal weight stored during the last few weeks of summer. Male hummingbirds stake their claims on the territories and systematically assault all intruders. When the female arrives, she too may be attacked, though in time the male will begin to court her with high-speed courtship flights. The male of each species makes characteristic nuptial swoops, but a representative pattern might begin 100 feet in the air and plunge through a J-shaped dive, sometimes too fast for the human eye to follow. Another pattern used by several species is the shuttle flight, a tight oscillation through an arc of a few feet or perhaps only a few inches. A female is usually perched near the low point of the arc. The shuttle is demonstrated by this young Salasphorus male testing his wooing technique. A black-chinned male uses the shuttle to display over his romantic prize hidden in the shrub. He'll mate with her, then resume his territorial blusterings, seeking other females, then leaving them all to build and tend a nest on their own. The female gathers bits of plant fibers and cobwebs to stick together a minute cup, perhaps under the tent formed by a sycamore leaf. In slow motion, we can watch a female broad-tailed hummingbird pick up a spider's drag line. This magnificent female, carrying a wad of cobwebs in her foot, stops by a feeder on her way home. Her nest nearly finished, this black chin uses her feet to tamp and shape the cup. She will lay, invariably, two eggs. The nest cup would barely accommodate a nickel, and the eggs are probably smaller than the nail on your little finger. She shades the eggs from the intense afternoon sun or broods them with the heat of her body settling onto the nest or leaving it by flight rather than footwork. In a little more than two weeks, the eggs hatch and the mother bird working alone intensifies her search for small insects. A mother black chin provisions her household hovering in a cloud of gnats. In his pioneering research on hummingbirds during the 1950s, Dr. Crawford Greenwalt learned that the distance separating the nest from the mother's principal nectar sources is extremely important. If the female has access to nectar close to the nest, she can make a feeding visit, refuel herself, and strike out immediately to catch insects for her young. Under such optimum circumstances, the young might pass the entire nest-bound period from hatchlings to fledglings in a scant 10 days. But if the female is obliged to forage for her own fuel at scattered locations, the development of the young might require up to 30 days, three times the period of vulnerability to storms, snakes, and jays endured by the young of better situated birds. The time saved by locating a nest near rich and dependable energy sources could give the female the opportunity to raise a second brood in a single nesting season. There are some plants, like this cardinal flower, which have selected hummingbirds as their special pollinator. In hummingbird pollinated flowers, the petals are typically fused into a tube which excludes most insects. The sexual parts of the flower are exposed where they'll tap the hummingbirds on the head to make the pollen exchange. 
Sometimes you can see so much pollen on the head of a foraging bird, you think you've discovered a new species. Don't let the pollen mark throw you off. There are no hummingbirds in the U.S. with white or yellow on the crown plumage. But this male broadbill appears to be wearing a white cap. Ruby throats in the east often show a pollen mark. Thistle flowers are attractive to hummingbirds, perhaps more as a source of small insects than for nectar. In warm climates, the mimosa tree appeals to the birds, and it's a glory to behold. bell-shaped blossoms of hosta are appealing. And the pollination of trumpet creepers is left just about entirely to hummingbirds. The color red is particularly attractive to hummingbirds because insects don't see red. Over evolutionary time, the plants have shaped their blossoms to restrict insects, but to be accessible to the long probing tongue of the hummingbird. Coloring their flowers red, certain plants have trained the birds to associate red with flowers meant for them alone. So we can plant the salvia and the bee balm, the penstemons and the cardinal flower, deep red blossoms rich with nectar, which is inaccessible to most insects, but positioned within reach of a hummingbird's tongue. The bill is shaped to penetrate flowers. It sheathes a long, tubular, brush-tipped tongue. The tongue darts into the crevices of the flowers, lapping at the nectaries. When we slow down the sequence of the ruby throat snatching the spiderling, we see the prehensile tongue wrap around and draw the morsel into the bird's mouth. The birds are also capable of a considerable gape, which may be employed in gnatting and other insect gathering enterprises. Amid our plantings, we can hang feeders to make our garden irresistible to hummingbirds. These birds are nearly ubiquitous, have little reason to fear man, and are quick to exploit new opportunities for modern living. If you plant the right flowers, and put out the feeders, you'll have hummingbirds in numbers. Feeding hummingbirds is rife with controversy. To get right to basics, there's only one thing to feed hummingbirds, table sugar dissolved in clear water. Dr. William Calder of the University of Arizona is a leading researcher of hummingbirds. And so the concentration of most of the hummingbird flowers runs about 25% sucrose, table sugar by weight, um, one in four mixture of, of sugar and, and water is going to do it. It doesn't hurt them if it's more dilute or more concentrated, but um, that's, that's a good general figure to head for. Uh, it's quite popular to, has been, to add red food coloring of one form or another to the solution because birds, the hummingbirds are attracted to the red. Uh, that's because the insects don't see the red and therefore something that is red in the way of a flower is sort of marked as special for hummingbirds. But um, they, the, in nature, the nectar is not what's red, it's the flower. And if you handle the birds as I do for banding them and so forth and catch birds that have been to other people's feeder and they uh, because they're getting a lot of fluid, they're constantly urinating, and the urine comes out blood red. You sort of wonder, is this good for a bird? Hummingbirds will investigate almost anything that's red. If they find sugar water inside, as far as they're concerned, that's a feeder. There's nothing wrong with an open jar tilted in a wire support. Such homemade feeders cost nothing, and they're easy to clean. Trouble is, they may have to be topped off every few hours, and they collect bees. This is an excellent single port feeder. In a remote Arizona canyon, 
It attracted this black-chinned hummingbird just minutes after it was hung. The bird's first encounter, no doubt, with this form of serendipity. The tube and container are glass. That's important under the western sun where clear plastic can deteriorate in a year or two. You can clean the container with a bottle brush and the tube with a Q-tip. The four fountains model is an excellent design because the birds can rest while feeding, the container is glass, and it's accessible for cleaning. Multiple ports blocked visually from each other give the more timid birds a chance to feed. If ants become a problem, you can paint baby oil or Vaseline on the wire suspending the feeder, where the birds won't be in contact with it. Other birds are likely to discover your feeders, a bonus more than a problem. Orioles everywhere have a taste for fruit which is easily shifted to sugar water. Scots, bullocks, and hooded orioles in the southwest, northern orioles in the east. Across its extensive range in the southwest, the acorn woodpecker finds ways to exploit feeders. Even house finches may take a turn. So let's summarize what the experts tell us about feeding hummingbirds. There are reports of some astounding substances being dispensed, including brews like diet cola laced with perfume. There's only one food that's known to be safe for hummingbirds, and that's table sugar. One part sugar, dissolved in four parts water, mimics the natural nectars hummingbirds prefer. The sugar dissolves easier if the water's hot. We have to remember that these birds are eating what to us would be the equivalent of 10 to 15 gallons of nectar a day. Any impurities or ill-advised components could have an intense effect. Research has shown that honey can cause sores on the birds' mouths. Red food coloring is unnecessary and may be harmful. Ideally, the solution in your feeder should be changed and the feeder should be rinsed thoroughly every day. Avoid the use of detergents or cleaning agents because minute amounts left in the feeder could sicken your birds. Watch for dark smudges of fungus growing inside the feeder. A bottle brush or a Q-tip will usually get the fungus out, but if not, you can scour it out by shaking a few tablespoons of sand around in some water. Here's a good rule of thumb. Put out no more sugar water than your hummingbirds are eating in one day. That way, the food will always be fresh and you'll be reminded to clean the feeder daily. Until you attract a lot of birds, a small feeder may be better than a large one. At the end of the season, where there are, when there are fewer birds around, you have a danger of the stuff that sits in there long enough before it's used up that it could spoil. And this little feeder here uh, is nice in that regard, and it only holds, um, uh, I think, about 300 milliliters when it's full. And, and that, therefore, it's going to be used up uh, fairly rapidly, rather than have a large a pint-sized feeder that takes a long time for it to use it up. So that this way we can keep up with keeping them clean. And, uh, there's less chance of something building up. We've added, the manufacturer just sells it with just the bee guard and the, and the tube itself. We've added on a little plastic flower here to make it a little bit more noticeable mm -hmm. with the red. And then again, we don't have to put any food coloring in it. So, so that I think this is a, a way of ensuring that there's less likelihood of the thing uh, spoiling before the birds can use it up. Crawford Greenwalt calculated that a human as active as a hummingbird would have to eat about 155,000 calories a day. That's about 70 pounds of potatoes and would have to drink and perspire about 100 gallons of water to maintain normal temperature. If a human approaching life at the hummingbird's pace ran out of water, the body temperature would rise to over 700 degrees, and he or she would probably ignite. Some would say that a life lived at such a pace should quickly burn itself out. 
but there's evidence that hummingbirds are surprisingly long-lived. We've worked at this at the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory now since 1971, and uh, from what we've gotten from studying a whole population, we're now up to a maximum of 12 years for a female that we just caught uh, two weeks ago. But it's running about three and a half years for the average female and two and a half years for the average male. Almost every feeder will be claimed as the exclusive property of a dominant bird who will attack all others. If the dominant bird feeds for one minute of every 15, it is likely to spend the other 14 minutes defending the feeder. The ruby throat of the east is fond of battling for its food, and some individuals wear the scars. The fledgling ruby throat who barely made it to the feeder, gaping for food from bees and from its older siblings, gets a crude lesson in hummingbird politics. A few days later, the youngster scraps at the feeder with the rest. One way to keep the combat down to a dull roar is to position two or more feeders so that they are visually separated from each other and cannot be defended by a single despot. The hummingbirds have captured our hearts and we embrace their peccadilloes together with the endless joy of their company. To feel the wash of the littlest angel's wings as it caresses the hand which just hung the feeder brings out the best in us. For no other bird can catch the sun and toss it back to us. Thank you. 